is uh, probably still in the Nani Day by the looks of things. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Surprise, surprise. Bueno, um, I'm actually really excited about our next speaker. And so we're going to just to, um, we're going to uh, have a presentation and some um, some kōrero on our next kaupapa, and then we're going to go into lunch. Okay? So, um, Jolly Davis, who some of you may know, has actually spent a number of, um, on a number of occasions, uh, has been to Ohakuni to um, undertake her mahi, um, and share her mahi and share her tōna uh, with us. Uh, and uh, Jolly describes her mahi uh, as powerful restorative practices that bring rebalance, realignment, clarity, and wellness to the body, mind, and spirit. And I think that is a great start. Um, and it fits very well with what we're discussing here today. So, Ite Iwi, please show some love for Jolly. Um, my name's Jolie. Um, I am. I grew up in Ahipara. Um, my family is originally from Te uh, Hapu in the far, far north. Uh, currently, I reside in Lower Hutt, um, where I, I uh, run my home-based practice, um, and I also facilitate the Mama Order um, Mini Mini Edomiumi workshops. They are two-day weekend wāmanga, and they teach the foundations of my body work and healing. So I am a um, traditional midi midi and yomi yomi practitioner. Um, I was fortunate enough to be uh, to come across uh, people in my community and outside of my community, um, and work alongside and get to know people like Koe Pedalini, uh, Manu Korifa, and of course Atarangi Muri, who is my whanonga, and we're both muri pioneers. Um, and so that's, that's been my constant journey over the last 20 years of practice. Um, and I just wanted to put that up on the, the screen there when I used to ask um, Papa Joe Dullamy, what is midi midi, what is the meaning? And every time I asked him, he would give a different answer because of the, you know, they're quite the amazing speakers and orators. And this was one of the um, translations of midi midi that he gave. The tears of Rangi falling on Papa, the wind moving through the trees, the crashing of waves on the shore, and the cry of a newborn baby. So what he's doing, he's talking about everything, energy, modi, wairua, all of that stuff we incorporate um, into the mahi that we do. So I have been in Ohakuni um, recently to facilitate a um, community clinic day where I brought some practitioners here, and it was just an open, um, healing day for people in this community to come and experience midi midi, to get on the table and have a go. So that it wasn't a full on treatment sessions at all, it was more like taster sessions and a little bit of education for people so they, so they um, get a better idea of what the mahi is about. So I've already gotten ahead of the ball here because I know we're pressed for time so I'll quickly um, zip through key points in that. So midi midi and omi omi is um, as a powerful indigenous healing modality, okay? Hashtag not just massage. So one of the things that I teach and I focus on a lot is educating people that many people, although the word is used to describe massage, it's much, much more than that. Many, many and normal many is much, much more. It's a total healing modality. It's a philosophy and it's also a way of life. Mm. Um, much like, you know, so it's more than just a bunch of technique. People come to the workshop and they think they're going to learn a bunch of techniques. And then they think they're going to take those techniques away and be practitioners. And I'm like, no, 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 no. It takes time. And you have to connect to the mātauranga. And you have to connect with the whaiora. Uh, Mauri ki te mauri. This is how we work. So there's a lot that you need to, to learn and to take on. Um, and my journey in Miri Miri and Romi Romi has been 20 years and still to this day. Um, so it's a philosophy and a way of life, much like, you know, if you want to learn karate, you go and learn the moves. If you want to learn about karate, it is the philosophy behind it that underpins everything that we do. It also provides effective strategies for self-care. And this is some of the stuff that I wanted to 
take us through today, just a little bit of an introduction to how we use things like these tools like Rako, Kohatu, um, connecting with Te Taiao, our natural environment, and most importantly, reconnecting with our tinana again, because a lot of us are very disconnected from our own bodies. We're all up in our heads all of the time, and we're the last ones to know that there's something wrong with our own body. We are the last people to know that there is pain in our tinana somewhere. And a lot of people who get on my tables don't realise that they're in pain until I use this, or I use this, and I start poking around in the tinana and we locate the pain that they never knew was there. That's probably been there for years. So with these strings here actually is what it is. It's the full package. Okay, It's not just a mere treatment and it's not just a mere massage. It's transformational when it's um, applied in that way. So um, what I thought about um, the kaupapa that this um, hui today is about, you know, I just wanted to put forward these issues to consider for the future in terms of rongoa Māori, how do we practically um, bring it into what we're trying to create and, and um, sustainable health strategies for our whānau. Um, to me, I'm a doer. I'm not really someone who likes to sit around talking, analysing or debating things too much. Um, I've learned over the years that if you want to achieve something, you've just got to start doing it. And by doing it, you, you get results. And then other people start being drawn to what you're doing because it's getting results and because it's working. So that, that's my, from where I'm coming from, is let's just do it. Um, and the issues to consider here is increasing access to Rongoa Māori for whānau. These are issues that I um, come across a lot. You know, people, it's one thing to understand what Rongoa Māori is, and people are saying, yeah, that's great. You know, now we understand how it works. Right, who do we go to? And we're looking around in our community and we can't find who those people are. They're there, but because of disconnection and the whole Tonga Suppression Act and all that, a lot of our traditional practitioners are under the radar, you know, they're working on the down low, they're working out of garages for koha, um, and a lot of that is the fear that remains, the fear of being judged, the fear of being accused that you're not qualified to do what you're doing, and the fear of someone else, you know, telling you, who gives you the right to do that mahi? Mm. And I've been the person in that situation before, um, with Ministry of Health, and some of you may be aware of the issues that, that I went through a few years ago now, where Ministry of Health um, tried to charge me for doing something that other people felt I was not qualified to do because they had mana over that knowledge or that, that basket of mātauranga. They believed they had mana over that mātauranga. And it wasn't until I said, well, actually... We've been doing this for thousands and thousands of years, and it's called this over here. So it was about me educating people. You know, I'm not winging this. I was actually taught this by people who know much, much more than I do and are experts in their field. Unfortunately, um, those people have now passed. Papa Joe, um, Manu Korifa have passed. But fortunately for us, they actually taught thousands of people. Between the two of them, they probably... Th taught thousands of people, and not just in Aotearoa. I say to people, if you go to Germany right now, you will find people there practicing authentic romiromi. And they are really, really good because they were taught by the best. It's mind-blowing. If you go to Holland, you will probably see people there who are practicing authentic romiromi. Why is it that we, you know, we have to look, you know, everywhere to find authentic practitioners. It's really hard to find and identify who they are, but they're there. They're there. Um, so um, what, you know, I'm an advocate for rongoa Māori, and rongoa Māori in the terms of that it um, umbrellas all of our traditional practices, the rongoa, the body work, you know, and the healing side of things too, the karakia, it all comes under the umbrella of rongoa Māori. So, um, just a few other things that I wanted to bring up here. Disconnection, you probably heard this um, talked about already. So, all of this is coming from my um, understanding and experience, so what I've, how I've been taught to. Yeah, we've already probably heard this 
talked about already, disconnection causes disease. Um, in, in my experience, the main contributor to unwellness with our whānau is disconnection to mātauranga, to self-identity, reo whakapapa whānau, passion, purpose, power, wairua. All of those things causes disease. Um, something we all need to focus on, and what I was taught, is fully occupy your whare to maintain wellness. Fully occupy your whare, and this is your whare, this is my whare, and I ensure every day that I am fully here, present, in the here and now, uh, uh, in my own tinana. I'm not, I'm not living in the past, I'm spending a lot of energy going back there, thinking, dwelling on stuff that I no longer have control over, and same for the future. I'm here and now, because mana, when you break that word down, it literally means um, all power is here and now, in the present moment. This is where all our mana is, and therefore we need to fully occupy our tinana. Um, it always alarms me when I, when I, I, people get on my table and I'm treating them and I can feel that they're not fully in their tinana, if that makes sense. It's like nobody's home. And that's not good. <laughs> if we're all up in our heads all of the time, our energy is up here and not fully here. Do you understand that? That's, that's something we should all be aware of. So fully occupy your whare. Also in terms of we, we are uh, taking substances into our bodies that, you know, flip us out into alternate realities or maybe when we were all younger, we, I say, in the, um, we may have, <laughs> like, had a night out where there's a whole block of time that's missing, you know. No one's going to put their hands up and say, yeah, I, I know what that's like. Um, but in that time where you can't, you know, there's that block of time missing because you had one too many drinks or whatever, you're not fully in your body. Your way to it has actually gone somewhere else. It's not here. It's temporarily vacated the whare. So it makes you, therefore, it makes you more vulnerable to other energies moving in. And that's the danger. That's the risk that you take. If you're not fully here, then you can be sure something else will drop in and take up residence. And our rangatahi need to understand that. Our first responsibility is to self. Self, when it comes to, you know, caring for others and hauora and well-being. That is our first responsibility. Who's been on an Air New Zealand flight and they give you the safety message about, you know, when the oxygen mask falls down, what do we do with that mark? You know, what do we do? But our instinct is to go, and, you know, and a lot of us, that's how we live our lives. We try, we're busy trying to put oxygen masks on everybody else. And we're the last person to put that mask on. And by the time we realise, ooh, ooh crap, you know, we're running out. So please, please, can we be doing that? First responsibility is to us. And that's the first responsibility of the healer too. I've um, known many, many healers over the years that have, have not um, taken care of themselves in the way that they should have. And they had open door policies at their whare and people were coming all hours of the day and night to get treatment or rongoa. Um, and of course that's not sustainable. It takes a toll on you. It really does. Um, and so from my point of view, we lost a few of our highly regarded healers before their time. And as a community, we had to look at ourselves and, and say that, you know, we played a part in that. Because they said, yep, you can come to me any time of the day or night, and therefore we're like, oh, well, you know, I can go after work, I can go on a Sunday after church, that sort of thing. And we take it for granted. So part of self-care is learning how to say no. It's having real strong self-boundaries in place and being consistent with those, self, those boundaries and saying no to our whanau, that can be the hardest thing, right? So understand that stress accumulates over time. Stress accumulates. If you are, if this is your capacity to carry stress, all right, 
100% capacity. Imagine your glass. And over years and years and years, it starts off here and then the stress starts going up and up. You know, you have kids, you get bills, you got a mortgage, you get married. Here you are here, like 70% is your functioning level of stress. Then you get divorced and all of a sudden your functioning level, and then you lose your job, you know, you get demoted, you pay and all that. And so all of a sudden, you're 45 and your functioning level of stress is 90%. So it takes one more thing for you to overload and have a bad day. And when you overload, you know, you lose your rag. Some people have panic attacks. Really common, I see that a lot. People who are in permanent um, states of anxiety. Because the stress has been building up over 20 years worth and they come home and the washing wasn't hung out and then boom, they flipped out and they lost the plot. <laughs> okay, so, so we need to recognize this about ourselves. Like computers, think of yourself as a computer. When it starts to run slow, what do we need to do? Yeah, we need to defrag, we need to clear out the cookies, we need to reboot our systems. And at the very least, that's what a really good midi midi romi romi session does. It reboots everything and then all of a sudden, your functioning level of stress comes down to there. It's back at 40%, which means that you can now cope with life. You can now cope. Something stressful is going to happen and you'll just come back to baseline again. You will never, ever overload. <coughs> Okay, so a lot of us don't even know that. What stress accumulates? Yes, it does. Um, so recently, actually last week, I was approached by the uh, Māori and Pacific Caucus to take a team of practitioners into Parliament, which we did. And it was really um, interesting timing with what's going on right now with Kitty Allen. And that was the corridor or was like, oh, we really need this because of blah, blah, blah and our sister, Kitty. And, and um, so I took a team of 10 practitioners into Parliament. And it was open to anyone. But the initiative was driven by Māori and Pacific Caucus. And they wanted something traditional, culturally appropriate for them. They didn't want acupuncture. They didn't want other things that they didn't relate to. And so they really, really loved it. A lot of them had never experienced... Um, midi midi e romi romi before. So it was an eye opener for them. And as a result of that, we're talking about making some regular clinic evenings in Parliament. So that is a big deal. That is a big deal. If I'm in there, I'm actually engaging with change makers and telling them what we're doing and what we'd like to achieve, and they're on the same page, and then voila. Because I want to promote Romo and Māori as effective. Um, healing and self-care system. I really, really do. But sometimes people just need to know exactly, they need to be educated first what it is and then experience it. Even if it's just a short 20-minute session, that's all that we did, 20-minute sessions. And it really enlightened people. Um, there's another example about the effectiveness of Midi Midi and Romi Romi. We were asked to go to a small community um, a suburb in Wellington, high socioeconomic, um, high unemployment, lots of crime, and I, I won't say the name of this community because I might get, you know, people jumping up and down. Um, so I took some practitioners in there, and they'd handpicked 60 women, at risk, shall we say, women, um, and it was marketed under a, a, like a pamper day for women, but it was actually a healing day. So... Um, we knew as practitioners what was the most common thing that we would probably come across, the most commonest condition that we would see. So we were prepared for that, and to the point that we didn't even ask women what, where their pain was or what their problems were. Any ideas what that might have been? Hmm? What they wanted treatment for. Violence? No, no, I'm talking about a specific condition on the body. Sore backs, yeah, but a part of the back. Nope. Lower back. Lower back. 
And if you, if you work with the body, then you understand that everything has a kōrero. Everything has a meaning. Lower back is about lack of support in their lives. And a lot of wahine, no emotional support, no financial support, no whānau support. So therefore, we're going to see this lower back pain much more with these wahine. And we went straight to it. And they were like, how do you know it's so painful there? How do you know the pain's there? And we, we just know, we understand that. Uh, my son, who has recently come back from Australia, um, parted from his wife of 16 years. He's in managed isolation at the moment. And he said to me, while he was there in Australia, after parting from his wife, he goes, Mum, I'm going to go and play um, touch today. And I'm like, no, no, don't do that. He's like, why not? I said, because if you... <laughs> Just, just trust me, do not go and play any physical sports now. And he didn't listen, and he went out on the field, and he um, ruptured his Achilles. So it came right, it got better, got better, you know. Three weeks later, he goes, Mum, I'm going to go and play touch. I'm like, D do not, <laughs> don't go and play touch again. And he um, totally destroyed his knee. He was only on the field for five minutes. Boom. And so he just recently had knee construction surgery. So the Achilles in the knee is always, it always speaks about going through massive change in your life. It's all about changing direction and it's sudden and you're not prepared for it and you may have a lot of resistance to it. So he was actually prone to that sort of, those sort of injuries and I knew that. That's why I didn't want to go and play touch. Okay. Um, so yes, these ladies that we worked on um, in that community, I'm going to rub out there. <laughs> um, they went home to their whānau. Two weeks later, the organisers of that event went and um, caught up with them, had a kōrero with them to find out how they were feeling, what, what were their results, the outcomes. And not just that, they talked with their whānau. And there were massive changes at home. Massive changes at home to the point where the children are like, wow, whatever mum had done, she is like a different woman when she came back from that pamper day. What did she have done? Um, and she was calm for five weeks, a good month to five weeks. She wasn't on the kids' cases. She wasn't grumpy around the house. She wasn't picking fights with her tāne. And as a result, the whare was calm. It was tau. It was really, really tau. So all of the, the kids noticed that. The women, yes, they reported much less pain in their bodies. They felt calmer. They weren't so stressed out because we'd done this with them. Not only that, the organisers went out into the community and they were talking to the community services. Now, this, this um, community has services for Africa to the point where they're saying, we do not want any more services in our community. We're up to here with services. And that's why they asked us to go in, because they wanted they, they recognised that they needed healing. So the organisers went to all these community services, and every single one said to them, it's been so quiet, our phones aren't ringing. What has happened last weekend? What has happened last weekend? And that effect, those effects lasted for five weeks. And they called it the afterglow. Five weeks in that community, things were quiet. There, was no, there were no rushes to ED, the police were quiet, the women's refuge was quiet, all of that. Five weeks. 100% attendance at local schools for the first time in years. Principals wanted to know what was going on in the community, what had happened. They'd never seen that for years, and it lasted for five weeks, and then it started to slowly go back to baseline of people struggling to cope again. So our, that, that was really enlightening to us. It wasn't, um, we already know that. We know that if you heal the mama, you heal the whānau. We know that. I've been taught that from day one. Heal the mama, heal the whānau. Heal the mama, heal the community. Just give me all the women and I'll heal everyone. And that's not me being arrogant. That's what I know. And we have evidence to show that. Um... We also run the community clinic days, and at these clinic days, we make sure everybody fills out the evaluation forms at the end. So they're, you know, we're gathering our own evidence that midi midi and romi romi works. 
We're, we're out there gathering it now, so we know this. People are saying they're getting better results in one session with Miri Miri Romi Romi that they have going to physio and other things for weeks, months or years. Okay? Um, so that's just a bit of our 101 intro to things. Um, so moving into the future, you know, what I'm doing with the workshops and what I have been doing for the last five years is laying the foundations. I call them the foundations. Without that, you cannot build quality practitioners that are not grounded in cultural and traditional mātauranga. They have to be grounded in foundations. And then you layer um, teaching and experience and mātauranga on top of that. So it's taken me four to five years to actually have um, practitioners coming through now. Coming through now. And we, we're working to support those practitioners as much as we can to make sure that their practice and their understanding grows and develops and they gain experience. You know, it is a process. It's not a matter of just going to a course and then, voila, you come out the other end a practitioner. It doesn't work that way. That's not how we learn. We learn by experience and getting your hands on different kinds of bodies that present with a whole lot of different things. Okay? Kapoi? Shall we do some stuff? I'm over myself talking. <laughs> Would you like to do some quick? Have we got time? Ten minutes. Okay, so we're going to stand. Can we stand in a circle? Can we get everyone standing? Just push the chairs back. We've got 10 minutes. <laughs> Take it out on your next door neighbor. If you are okay to pie, you can just stay there if you like. You can just stay there if you like. We're going to get in a big circle. Big circle. Because I know we're hungry. Oh, come round here. Join it up. You can sit there, Kate Pie. Ah. Yeah, so turn to the person either side of you, say kia ora, shake their hands, whatever, introduce yourself. Because I don't know you, kia ora. Kia ora anō. And you're going, we're going to just do some cross call. It's left brain, right brain, right? Left brain, right brain. We're going to get things moving. So here is the action here. This is the action here. Okay? Front, back, down. Front, back, down. Other arm. Front, back, down. Don't think about it. Other arm. Back, down. Switch hands. Front, back, down. Front, back, down, switch. Just keep switching sides. Left brain, right brain. Front, back, down. Don't think about it. Other side. Front, back, down. All right, one more. Front, back, down. And I want you to march on the spot. March, 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 march. Tahi, rua, toru, fa. And we're going to go to the same side on the right like this. Tahi, rua, toru, fa, same side. Rua, toru, fa, same side. And you're going to switch, opposite. Rua, toru, fa, <laughs> tahi, rua, left brain, right brain. Tahi, rua, toru, fa, same side. Tahi, rua, toru, fa, and switch, other side. Rua. And switch and same side. Rua. Toru. Switch. Change. Toru. And stop. And back to this. Switch arms. Front, back, side. Switch arms. Front, back, side. Front, back, side. One more. Front, back, side. Marching. Marching. Rua. Toru. And we're going to change and change. E. Rua. Toru. Fa. Tahi. Rua. Toru. Fa. And change. Tahi. Rua. Toru. 
Pa, Tahi, Nua, Toru. Ah, okay, all right. <laughs> if we're constantly using one side of our brain, that's hard. It's hard. All right, so just turn to your left, the person in your facing, your left side. Yep, hands on their shoulders. Working. 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 Don't be nice. Find the tension. Find the tension. Work it out. Work it out. Don't be nice. <laughs> Don't be nice. And karate chop. Use the size of your hands. We're just trying to loosen up all these tight shoulders. Now the shoulders is the shoulders we hold a lot of our mental tension, eh? overthinking. Over the head's too busy, so we get tight shoulders. Kia ora, thank you. And you're going to turn around and do it on the other person. Feel the difference. Different shoulders. Different shoulders. Different feeling. Get in there. It's not massage. Release the tension. Release it. Release. Work in. Oh, different from the last one, eh? Everyone's different. <laughs> and karate chop. Karate chop. Very good. There's some t intense focus going on here. Now take your thumbs and find the notch at the base of their skulls. Their skulls. The notch and push your thumbs up into the base of their skull. Find those notches. Ah, here. Up here. Up here. Push your thumbs up in there. Base of the skull. Find those stress points, those headache points. Ouch, ouch, release, release, go to your own neck and find those points there, find the notch in the base of the, the notches in the base of the skull, drive your thumbs up into your skull, up, yourself, find your own spots there, yep, it should be tender, it shouldn't be excruciating No, if it is you're way too stressed. Take your fingers on either side of the spine. Fingers, dig them into the neck muscles and drag your fingers through and at the same time you push your neck back. Push, push, drag your fingers through those tight neck muscles. Push your head back. Release the neck. It's not a rub, it's fingers. Dig them in. Dig them in. Push your head back. Excellent. Take your fingers now to your traps. Here. Dig your fingers in. And you're going to pull through the muscle. Pull in and down towards the collarbone. The muscle. Trapezius. Pull in and down towards the collarbone. Yep. Work your way across. Closer to the neck there. It gets tighter. This is your body. It's like, hello. Hello. Didn't know that was there. Ah, you dig in. Real hard. Go to the other shoulder. Release it. Dig your fingers in. If it's sore, good. Dig in, pull forward to the collarbone. People look like they want to go to sleep. Okay, kia ora whanau. Thank you for that. Thank you for having me. Hey, Tilda! <laughs> 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 oh, you right with that? Yeah. You all done or? Yeah. Cool. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh. hey, hey. Neither do I. I have plans <laughs> to keep going, but you know. Thank you. How can we come to you?
Uh, well, I'm in Wellington. Yeah, yeah well, that's okay. That's I'm okay. in Wellington. Unless you're going to do a community. And I've got a workshop. So I am having a, a workshop in Ohakuni in June. This weekend I'm in Rotorua. Come this weekend. Oh, yeah, that's a lot. No, yeah. I've got to be in Palmy this weekend. Um, <laughs> so you've got one for Alex, I've got one for Denise. Okay. Who's for? Hang on, I'm going to get it. Um, but does anyone have any part-time or quarter medals to share? June for a workshop. Just email me if you'd like to register for that. June. Lots to do with this weekend. New Plymouth. Oh no, Palmerston North, sorry. Early May. Just go on the website there, there. <laughs> Palmerston North, yeah, May 1st and 2nd. So perhaps just um, one question from me, of course. You know, a lot of people, and you might have heard me talk about it this morning, uh, describe this as alternative medicine or, you know, these sort of things. And um, some people, what I loosely describe as, don't believe in, you know, what they have. Because what, what I, how I interpret what you're doing is you're bringing out something which you already have, right? And, and ourselves, and we just have to yeah. believe that we have it. And there are a lot of people, our people, that don't believe that, you know, they have it to our, in, in, in our own selves. Mm. And so what do you think would be some advice for those sorts of people who just need to, some, a little bit of afi and totoko to really believe that, you know, midi midi and dumi dumi are ways to achieve wellness? Well, we all, I mean, like I said before, they're, they're, any, anyone can learn this. Anyone can learn this. Everyone, whakapapas do it because we all descend from Eo. We all come from the spiritual realms. And this is what um, Papa Joe used to teach, you know, healing is for everyone. We all carry the potential to heal another person and also to heal our own bodies. The potential is there. We just are disconnected from that understanding. Um, so I encourage, you know, I have not just Māori, but I have people from all over the world that come to my workshops, Pākehā, Asian, you know, because on some level everyone relates to it, even non-Māori are like, oh, I just feel like I recognise this mahi, you know, they really take to it, anyone, anyone can learn this, and I encourage everyone to learn this mahi, it's not just for <coughs> us, we share it with everyone. Hey, Pātai, know any final questions before we break? Just for me, Kia fire. I, I just wanted to ask or help us, some of us here anyway, that might need just a bit of assurance of how to protect ourselves around that mahi. Mm. Yeah, this is, this is all of the stuff that I get into on the workshops. That's part of the foundational um, learnings that people must have. Yeah. And, and although I take it for granted that people should know this stuff, but obviously... Yeah, there's that disconnection from mātauranga. So it is important. How to keep ourselves well and safe is a huge part of the foundations that, that I teach. And it starts with your, your, your boundaries, your self-boundaries, and learning how to say no, and the self-care, looking after yourself. Um, but how to keep yourself safe in terms of when you're doing the mahi, there are specific strategies that we, we need to do. And karakia is just one of them. Just one of them. Yeah. Hi. Tato Tena. Any more old one over here? Thank you for that. I, I feel actually a little bit um, de stressed at the moment. I just want to, I, I wanted to ask you your, your thoughts around, um, the, you know, like, you know, that our, our aspirations are around <coughs> our wellness centre and about. Working that side by side with um, with the clinical environment versus mm. our rongo Māori um, practices. How do you see that from your perspective in terms of... of, of I knew of someone was going to ask me that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I knew someone was going to ask. Um, that's, that's a tricky one. It really depends on... The medical practitioners, I mean, they must be open 
they must be educated on, on rongo and Māori and what it is. Um, but I, I myself, I don't have, I don't feel the need to go out and establish relationships with medical practitioners myself. Um, I just understand that the, the work that I do gets results for people and that miri miri and romi romi, rongo and Māori has its own mana. It has its own mana, so that's all I'm worried about really is protecting that. The minute we get alongside something, there has to be an un that understanding there that rongo is not going to come underneath the mana of somebody or something else. And this has been a problem in the past. When we go into um, like medical institutions or hospitals, <coughs> we're under the mana of that institution, if that makes sense. So I think um, for myself, my opinion is that we should stand alone in our own mana. That's my opinion. Um, until I come across medical practitioners who are open and, and fully understand and respect the mana of rongo and Māori, that's probably going to be my position until it changes. Yeah. Yeah. I was interested to know that because a number of years ago, we worked with um, Aunt who, um, who, who had that clinical side as mm. well as the rongo and Māori, which, and, um, and part yeah. of that was to ensure that you know, any any person who came in to work in, and and that at that day, and that day it was Te Oranga Nui, that they must do a an, mm. um, an induction with her before we even got to the other other parts of it, and that they had to have um, a, a better understanding of it, and then as time went on, that education um, mm. came. So, yeah, I think that's an ongoing discussion. Yes, yeah. Um, but, you know, the question is, do we need to be side by side, alongside? Um, because, you know, that's the background that I'm, I'm a trained nurse as well. So, I mean, I worked in there, I saw our whanau get sicker and sicker. I see the over-medication, the over-diagnosis, over, you know, um, and, and, I, and I honestly didn't really see whanau getting better, just being highly medicated. Mm -hmm. So that's why I do what I do now. This, to me, gets better results. And again, it's just my opinion, my experience. I haven't, I haven't seen an example of where the two um, different modalities can work alongside together. I, I haven't seen that yet. So if there is potential for that to exist, then, yeah, I'd be interested. <laughs> I'll put it that way. Okay? And actually, I think that's a perfect yeah. way to end because yeah. that's about realising those opportunities that exist in front of us, right? Yeah. It hasn't happened as well as it could have in the past, but... Or do we have a big job on our hands mm. to bring the two worlds together? Um, so, namahi nui kia koe, uh, e taku waene. Uh, o tira uh, ki ngā kōrero me ngā taonga, uh, kua uhi a mai ki ronge ki a mātou, all of the taonga that you've shared with us um, uh, this afternoon. Um, and I'm sure there are others that are willing to dig deeper into what you've said, because I think we're just scratching the surface. Mm. Um, and so I look forward to um, understanding, you know, uh, the plenty of opportunities that will come from having these sorts of conversations. Before we go to lunch, just to also mihi to um, Pa uh, for his mm. session down at, uh, at Mountain Road, just outside our, um, one of our offices there, um, and sharing all of the, the kōrero about our ngāhere and everything else that comes with it. And if I can reflect on one takeaway that I, that I had from um, Pa, which is still st sticking with me now, is... Uh, we need to understand Koro and what he's wearing. Mm. Mm. And I interpret that in a certain way, and I'm sure you'll have your own interpretations. Uh, and I'm sure in the things that he wears on a daily basis um, can have a lot of teachings for us. Um, and so, you know, teachings by way of understanding our taio, uh, but also understanding how the taio can um, play a part in our, in our ora. And that's um, some of the copa pa that Charlie has brought through in terms of using dako and things. So um, with that, I will say karakia. We will have lunch, and we're going to come back at quarter past, uh, is that one or two? two. Quarter past two. Uh, and um, we'll have our um, final speakers for the afternoon. Nō reira ki noi tātou. Anau mai ngā hua o te wā o te ngā kina o te wai tai o te wai Māori. Nā tāne, nā rongo, ko rangi nui e tui hone, ko papatua nuku e takoto nei. Turu turu o witi waka maua kia tēnā, tēnā haumi e huie. Tāi kia. Kia ora tātou. Let's eat. Goodie. Yeah, that's a good question.